All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about scaling solar with React. Uh, really quickly, a little bit of who I am. Um, I'm a developer at Basho Technologies, uh, the makers of the React database. Um, I previously worked for AOL, for the subsidiary advertising.com. Um, most of my programming experience is in Java and Erlang. Um, I've spent about two years working uh, in the search field, uh, so I still consider myself a bit of a, bit of a newbie, especially uh, with the company uh, I'm keeping at this uh, conference. Um, and speaking of this conference, uh, I'm very uh, honored that they allowed me to speak here, given the company. Um, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am at rzizeski. So today, I'm not going to talk so much about search. I'm hoping that at this conference, most of you at least have an intermediate idea of, of search, and especially Lucene and solar. Um, today, I want to focus more on scaling solar with React instead. So the agenda is going to be uh, a overview, quick overview of React, a uh, quick overview of Yokozuna, um, and then I want to talk about the distributed bits. Uh, I want to talk about data partitioning and ownership, um, uh, high availability and consistency, uh, and self-healing or anti-entropy. Um, and at the end, I hope to have a few demos to show you. So first, uh, what is React? React is primarily a key value store. Um, uh, inspired by the, the Dynamo paper, if any of you have read that. Um, but it has some extra things, too, which I'll be talking about. Uh, it's distributed, which means um, it spans multiple nodes, or you have multiple nodes in your setup. Uh, you can run it as one node, but that's not typically how you run React. Um, it's highly available, which means you can have multiple failures in the system, multiple nodes go down, and you can still uh, service reads and writes. Um, it's masterless, uh, or another way to say that is peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning that any node in the system can equally take a read or a write or any given operation. Um, it's eventually consistent, and I feel like people get confused on this term a lot, eventually consistent. A lot of people think that means you do the write and it gets copied in a few milliseconds or something like that, and I think that really misses the point of what eventually consistent means. It's more about the fact that if you compare it to, say, an ACID database, like a, a Postgres or something like that, the consistency is guaranteed up front. Eventual consistency is more about um, relax the consistency requirements up front and um, have them eventually converge on the back end when you do a read. Um, and the purpose of that is that you can gain availability that way. Um, and React also has the notion of scale up and scale down, meaning you can add and remove nodes uh, as you need to, depending on your load. And one of the nice benefits of React is that as you add nodes, you can get an almost linear scale up of your operations. So React's a database, primarily key value model, but it has more than that. It has uh, basic secondary index support. Uh, for example, um, you can add a tag to your objects um, uh, to do uh, exact term queries or range queries. So uh, pretty basic, but it has more than key value. Um, it has MapReduce, but when people hear MapReduce, they tend to think Hadoop. Um, it's not quite that. It's more of a real-time um, transformation. So you kind of want to already know your keys. And then what it allows you to do is use JavaScript or Erlang um, to transform the values of those keys. So for example, if, if, if it was JSON, uh, you could use MapReduce to splice it apart or transform it in some way. And also there's search, which is what I want to focus on today. Uh, currently, there's React Search, which is in React, and that's a Lucene-like implementation written purely in Erlang, uh, but it's kind of limited. It doesn't have all the great functionality that you see in Lucene and Solar. And that was kind of um, the idea behind Yokozuna, was to replace our current in-house implementation with something like Lucene or Solar, which is proven and has all these features that people expect. Um, so it's distributed. It means many many nodes, uh, typically in a LAN. We don't recommend running a given cluster over a WAN uh, because you get unpredictable latencies and more chance of partitions. Um, and we, all, we typically recommend starting with, with, uh, with five nodes. And we also have an enterprise version, which includes uh, replication that can span a WAN, and we call that multi-data setter replication, or MDC. Um, high availability, so always takes writes, always, take, uh, always takes reads. 
Um, it favors yield over harvest, which I'm going to explain what those are a little later. Uh, and it implies eventual, eventual consistency to have that availability. Um, so it's masterless. There's no notion of a master or slave in React. All the nodes are hetero, uh, homogeneous. Uh, they're all treated equally and can all perform the same operations. Um, so any node can service a read, write, or query. Um, eventually consistent, so reads can be stale. You can have uh, concurrent actors on a given key, which can cause siblings. Um, but eventually, uh, those values will converge. So Yokozuna. Yokozuna is about the integration of React and Solar. Uh, index React data with Solar and distribute Solar with React. Um, and together, they are able to do what one cannot do by itself. Um, so each node will run a local Solar instance. Um, and in React, there's the notion of a bucket. So when you create an index, it's named the same as your bucket. And as data comes in to that bucket, um, uh, Yokozuna will extract uh, that data into a document that Solar can understand and then locally index it. Um, and currently, it supports plain text, XML, and JSON, um, but there's also plans to add Solar Cell support. And for those that don't know what Solar Cell is, uh, that's, that uses Apache Tika to, to parse binary data like uh, Word documents, uh, PDFs, metadata out of images, um, and I'll be adding that soon. Um, Yokozuna also supports tagging. Um, the idea of that is it's kind of like the secondary indices we have. Uh, for example, maybe your value is opaque, and uh, Yokozuna wouldn't, or Solar wouldn't understand how to index it. Tagging allows you to add metadata to it to say, I want to add these tags. Um, or even if it was plain text or JSON, maybe you just want to add user tags to it, and you can do that and also query on them. Um, Yokozuna uses the Solar query syntax. It doesn't try to add a facade on top currently. Um, so if you already know how to run queries against Solar, you can query Yokozuna. Um, the parameters are passed through verbatim. And um, basically, uh, under the hood, Yokozuna will use Solar's distributed search. So if distributed search supports a certain feature, then Yokozuna will support it. Um, but I want to make it clear that there's no Solar Cloud involved. So when I say distributed search, I mean the distributed search that's been part of Solar for a while now, not the, not the new Solar Cloud stuff. All right, so partitioning and ownership, or uh, off Tilan and Egentum. I hope I didn't butcher that too bad. Oh, ah, hold on, I skipped. So when you start talking about a distributed system, um, right, the whole idea is that you can't necessarily fit all your data on one machine. Um, or maybe you can, but you can't handle the load on one machine. But the second you introduce multiple systems, you have to have this idea of partitioning, right? They're not all going to have a replica of all the data because the whole reason you distributed it was to span it out. So you have to partition. And partitioning also implies the notion of ownership. Um, you can't just randomly partition data, throw it all over the place. You need to know where is it. So these two things are very important to solve. And the first way that most people might do, although I feel like people are catching on that this doesn't work, um, is naive hashing. And naive hashing is you take the hash of a key, and then you modulo that by the, your number of nodes. Um, and, and that works. You get something like this, where you have three nodes, and you write various keys, um, and they just appropriately go where they need to go. But there's a huge problem with this. If you add a node, you'll notice these, these red keys represent keys that have now changed their location. Um, so if you've noticed, there's a lot of red keys compared to the orange keys. In fact, there's two-thirds of the keys have moved. And in general, what you get with this naive hashing approach um, for the number of keys moved is k times nn minus 1 over nn. Um, and eventually, nn minus 1 over nn grows towards 1. You know, if you had 9 nodes, uh, 9 out of 10 is 90%. So you end up moving almost all your keys in your, in your system, uh, which isn't ideal. So then there's the idea of consistent hashing. Uh, consistent hashing is basically the same idea, except you bring in a new abstraction. You think of this thing called a partition. Um, so you take the hash of the key, and you modulo it by your partitions. And the difference is, is part, the number of partitions remains constant all the time. And a key always maps to the same partition. Um, and then the difference is the nodes own partitions. Your, your physical nodes are what own partitions, and the partitions contain the keys. So you have this extra level of indirection. And another way to think of it, and if anyone here already knows React, you might have heard vNode, which stands for virtual node. And virtual node is, is the reified idea of a partition. 
Um, and that's because this is really the same as naive hashing. It really is the idea of a virtual node, and it's allowing you to map many virtual nodes on actual physical nodes. You know, th there's that famous quip, uh, every computer science problem can be solved by one level of indirection, and that's exactly what consistent hashing gives you. Um, so if we do the same example again, you'll see it's the same thing, except now we have this box, this partition. And if you go to add a node now, only partitions move, and you'll notice a lot less uh, keys had to be moved around. So what you get in general is NN, which is the number of nodes, times K over Q. And as K grows, you know, K, you might have billions of keys, NN essentially becomes a constant. You don't have to worry about it. So it's essentially K over Q. And obviously, K over Q is less than K. Um, so the nice thing about consistent hashing and the way React does it is that it evenly divides the key space, um, and you get a logical partitioning separated from physical. Um, and uh, if you have a uniform hash, which React uses, you get a uniform distribution, which for anyone who knows Solar, that's really important because when you run distributed queries, there's no um, distributed IDF, uh, inverse document frequency, so you need to have an even distribution for your ranking to be correct. All right, so the way React does this partitioning, it has the notion of a ring. So the ring is your entire key space. You take that key space and you chop it up in equal, partition, uh, equal uh, size partitions. And then for each partition, uh, a node decides to own it. Um, and the goal of React uh, uh, claim is to try to have um, each node own an even number of partitions uh, to spread it out. Because currently, we, we assume a homogenous setup uh, the nodes are the same. Uh, this might change in the future. We might have something called weighted claim, where you might have, say, 10 really beefy nodes and 10 smaller ones, because maybe you're migrating or something like that, and will allow you to have an uneven number. But currently, um, it's all even. So if you have this and you go to add a node, some of the nodes will give up their partitions. And once again, it'll try to keep that even distribution. Um, so the ring is the state structure that is gossiped between nodes. And it has something called a, a epoch-based consensus. Uh, and all that really means is that uh, when a node joins, um, a new ring is formed, and that ring is gossiped around the cluster until an epoch is hit, a monotonically increasing version. And the reason you do that is then you know all the nodes have agreed on a certain event in time. Um, and this is the same idea with people that use Zookeeper and stuff like that. You, know, you want to make sure everyone agrees on something. And this is just kind of our own in-house thing, just specifically uh, for node ownership. Um, and the other nice thing about the ring um, and consistent hashing is this is what makes it masterless. Um, every node has the data structure, and we know they all agree on it, and every node knows the algorithm to apply to the data structure to figure out what node owns the data. And that's what allows any node in the system to deal with any read or write. So this is what writes uh, kind of look like, is you have your nodes, you have your partitions, um, the keys are written, that's in React, the, the key value data, and then each node will have a local solar instance, and it'll locally index uh, those, the, the values for those keys. And then at query time, um, uh, well, what I didn't mention here, actually, the other thing to notice is this is what's called a doc-based partitioning, um, which means for a given term you want to search, um, the index is going to be a spread, a spread across all the all the nodes, which means you need to do a, what's called a cover, uh, coverage query. You have to talk to, to all the nodes, which is what we see here. So when you do a query, it can go to any of the nodes, and then um, that node will figure out what's the, the covering set, the coverage, and it'll add a shard parameter to your solar uh, query and then run a distributed search on the local solar node, which will then talk to the other solar nodes, merge it properly, you know, do all the ranking, and then it'll be returned verbatim uh, by Yokozuna. Uh, which gives it another nice feature that if you already have existing solar clients that you use and know how to run queries with them, you can run it directly against Yokozuna. All right, so high availability. Uh, Hoffer Fuegbarkeit. No? <laughs> um, so I'm going to start this with a rant. Uh, everyone loves to talk about uptime, right? You know, how many nines you have. But uptime is a poor metric uh, because... Well, rather than tell you why, I'm going to explain it with a question. If the system is down and no one makes a request, is it really down? And what that's getting at, what the problem is, is if your users don't notice your downtime, then is it really down? Um, if you have downtime during peak hours, 
versus downtime during off-peak hours, that's vastly different, especially if these queries are what drives the revenue of your company. You don't necessarily care that your system was down 12 o'clock at night when no one was using it, but if it was during 12 in the afternoon, and say your guilt group, and that's when you get your, you know, your herd effect, that's when everyone does their business, well, if your system's down, that's, that's a big deal. So in 2001, a guy by the name, or a guy named Eric Brewer, uh, the father of CAP, for anyone here who knows the CAP theorem, uh, wrote an article called Lessons from Giant Scale Services. And in this article, he, um, he introduced something called Harvest for Shield, which is um, similar to, to CAP, but I think it's a little easier to understand. So the idea of yield is queries completed over queries offered. And right, so this is directly about the user now. Um, if you offered um, uh, you know, 90 queries, or uh, 100 queries and only got 90 of them returned, then you had a 90% yield. Um, and this directly cor correlates with your revenue, right? Um, so, and, and so we're downtime won't be different at all, right? We're downtime, depending, downtime doesn't care when you're down, yield will be vastly different if you're down during peak versus off-peak hours. But there's this correlating factor with yield, um, yield versus harvest, and th this is what gets into the availability versus consistency talk. Um, harvest is the idea of data available um, over the complete data. Uh, so say you have um, a million keys in your system, and for whatever reason, at a certain point in time for a given request, um, only 900,000 of them are available. Well, that means you have a 90% harvest. And that also means if you do a primary key lookup for one of those values, there's a 10% chance that you'll get a not found when you shouldn't. So you have this notion of a degraded harvest, which is inconsistency, right? You should have gotten a value, but you got a not found, therefore inconsistency. And the point of this is during a failure or an overload situation in your cluster, um, you got to decide between harvest and yield, or harvest or yield, I'm sorry. Um, you can either, you know, when those keys are missing, uh, those 100,000 keys are missing and a user asks for a key, well, you can either say, um, I don't necessarily have all the data to look at, so I'm going to fail and I'm going to degrade your yield, or I'm going to hope that the key you asked for isn't that 90% that I have and I'm going to give it back. And you have to choose. For a given request, you have to choose. And this is what CAP is all about. And anyone who tells you that they're highly available and consistent at the same time is feeding you a line. And this is why. You cannot have both for a given request. So harvest and yield, you, don't, you can have 100% of them even during failures. So you can have 100% of both even during failures. And the way you do that is with replication. You know, there's no magic here. You just have to maintain multiple copies of a given datum to still have it when failure occurs. Um, so in React and Yokozuna, there's a notion of the end value. And the end value is the number of replicas to store uh, for both the key value data and for your index data. Um, and it's the default of three. Um, more rep and you can change this. It could be less replicas or it could be more replicas. Uh, and basically, um, more replicas trades IOPS and space uh, for more harvest under failure. So this is kind of what I showed you earlier. Uh, a key comes in, goes to a node, is written locally and indexed locally. But this is what it really looks like in React since it's replicated. A key goes to a node, it's, it's written and indexed locally, but it's also sent to the other nodes and written and indexed locally there too. And what's not obvious from this diagram, which what I also want to point out, is it's not um, like an async, like log style thing. It's not a master-slave thing. Um, any node can take the write. It spins up something called a coordinator, and that coordinator in parallel sends it to all the replicas, all n nodes that it needs to go to. So it's done immediately rather than um, async. Um, and the nice thing about this is now before, if you were just writing one, if that one node went down, then you've already lost harvest, where here, you could have two of these nodes go down and you still have 100% harvest because at least one of the replicas is available. Um, and there's another nice feature of this. Earlier I said, you know, this dock-based partitioning. You have to query all the nodes to make sure um, you, you get 100% harvest to make sure you see all the data. Uh, but with replication now, you only have to um, hit a covering set of nodes. Um, and that's what Yokozuna does. There's this notion of coverage in React uh, where it finds all the partitions that cover 
all of the data to give you 100% harvest. And Yokozuna will do that, build the coverage plan, which then builds the shards list, and then pass that to the local solar node to run. And once again, when I say distributed search, no use of solar cloud. So then getting back to availability, getting back to yield, there's this idea of sloppy quorum. And this is the main mechanism that allows React um, to always be write available and always be read available. Um, so you have n replicas, and that implies the idea of a preference list. There's preferred owners, um, and you might call those primaries. But then you could temporarily store data on other owners, and you could call them secondary. And what sloppy means is you allow non-primary owners to own that data. Uh, so the idea is when certain nodes fail and they can't take that write, you don't just simply say, well, I'm not going to write those replicas. You go to a secondary owner, and he temporarily handles it for you. Um, and then he'll pass it back to the proper owner when he comes back up, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, so what this gives you is 100% yield, but potentially uh, degraded harvest as well, because you could choose to read from the secondary owners, which might not have the full data set. Another idea in React, which allows you to trade these yield versus harvest uh, parameters, is tunable quorum. Um, so we have the n replicas, and then we have these, these knobs, um, uh, R and W. So you're always going to make a request to the n values, right? So if you do a read and your n is 3, it's always going to go out to all 3. But what you can say is you can say, well, I only care that 2 respond and give me some kind of value. And if those 2 respond and give me a value, then I'm going to return. Um, and the same goes for writes. You can say, well, I just want to wait for one uh, owner to act the right, and then I'm good to go. Uh, so it allows you to trade off you know, some speed, some latency, and also your harvest for shield. And this is per request. Uh, and also there's PR and PW, which is the notion of, um, it's the same as PNR, but it says, I want to have this minimum number of primaries involved. So React has a notion of siblings, right? There's no master to serialize the ops. There's no uh, serializability like you would get in an asset database. So you can have concurrent actors on the same key, and those options can interleave. Um, and we all know what happens when you let options interleave on mutable state. You know, you can lead to conflicts. Um, so what React does is it uses something called a vector clock. Um, and a vector clock is just a fancy name for the idea of logical time. And what it allows you to do is notice that two writes did not follow from each other. The one write did not see the history of the other one, and so therefore they're parallel versions. Um, and that allows you to detect a conflict and then store both values to later return to the client so they can merge it. Um, it's kind of a similar idea for those that use you know, Subversion or Git, and both of you modify the same file, but you changed it in a way that conflicted with each other, and then it goes, hey, I don't know what to do with this. You figure it out and then recommit. It's kind of a similar idea. And Yokozuna, uh, we'll index all the siblings. So when, you, when siblings are made, uh, you can still, when you query, if it matches on any of them, you'll get the key back. All right, so now I want to talk a bit about self-healing, or uh, Zell Ips Tylon. So hand in hand off, this gets back to the sloppy quorum idea. Um, when nodes go down, someone else needs to take that data, because you want to try to maintain that, that constant n number of replicas. Um, but when they come back up, you don't want that data to stay there because um, the algorithm wants to think it's on the primary node. So you have to somehow give it back. Um, and so that's what Hinted Handoff is about. And this is what it looks like. So a typical write comes in, you have your key, and let's say its preferred list, its, its primaries, are P1, P2, and P3. And that's owned by node 3, node 1, and node 2. But let's say for a second that node 1 is down, so P2 is unavailable. What React will do is it'll temporarily write it to um, P3, which is owned by node 2. And then at some point in the future, um, whoop, I think I missed a slide on you guys. Yeah, so that's not, uh, oh, there we go. So at some point in the future, node 1 will come back up, node 0 will realize that, write it back to P2, and then kill its local copy because it doesn't need it anymore. Um, and this is called hinted handoff. And the reason it's called hinted is because when this copy was stored on node 0, there was a hint with it. There was a hint with this data that made it realize I shouldn't actually be here when my proper owner comes up, send me back. Um, so read repair. 
there's a chance that all your replicas might not agree for various reasons. Um, you know, you could lose disk on your system. Um, maybe a, a put to one of the remote partitions got dropped for whatever reason. A seg fault happened at just the right time. For whatever reason, there can be divergence. Um, so the idea behind read repair is, like I said earlier, when you do a read, you always go to all n. You go to all three. Um, and you might actually only wait for two of them. Your R might be two. But what the coordinator will do is wait around longer for all three values and check, do you guys agree? If you don't, I'm going to fix you, and then I'm going to send you back. So what read repair is really about is taking advantage of the fact that you already decided to, to, to take the cost of the IOPS to get that data back. You might as well check that it's consistent and then send it back. All right, so this is my favorite one, active anti-entropy. So Yokozuna is made up of two systems, right, on two different VMs. You have um, your Erlang VM with React, and you have your Java VM with Solar. And any time you do something like this, you have a much greater chance for inconsistency between those systems, right? You don't have atomic operations. You, you know, it's, it's spanning these two systems, so it's a lot harder uh, to keep them consistent. And, you know, files can be truncated. You can have corruption. Uh, someone could accidentally RMRF your directories. Um, there could be a seg fault between the time the key value um, datum is written and between the index write, um, which means the key value would have it, but the index wouldn't. And, you know, lots of other things could happen. So the point is there's a myriad number of failure scenarios. And some of them are very obvious, but there's some that are nearly invisible. Like if you had a seg fault at the right time, you know, how do you know whether or not um, the key value got indexed? Um, So in order to detect these things, uh, React and Yokozuna use something called a Merkle tree. And the idea behind a Merkle tree is at the bottom, you have these list of key hash pairs. And then at the top, you have a hash of the hashes under, at the bottom. And then at the top, you have a hash of hashes of hashes of hashes. So the point is it's a hash tray. Um, and the, point, the reason you do this is for efficiency, right? Um, if you have a billion objects, you don't want to have to iterate through all of them to know if there's a difference. That's going to take a long time, and it's going to eat up a lot of IOPS um, and a lot of CPU. Uh, so the idea is you keep these hash trees built as you go, and then you could compare those million ob or billion objects with just a, a compare of two hashes. And you could tell, oh, yes, they all agree. I'm good. Good to go. So when you do an exchange, you take the trees, uh, you compare the top, and you go, oh, well, that's different. And you go down. You say, oh, there's another difference on the right-hand side, so you follow that. Another difference. And then you go down here, and this is where you, you iterate the list of ashes. And then you find the two differences, and then when we find a divergence, uh, what we do is do a read, which will invoke read repair, and then we also do a re-index. Um, so both the, the KV object and the index will be uh, reconverged to make sure they're, they follow each other. Um, so a little more on these trees. Uh, they're durable. Uh, it's actually a custom implementation written on top of LevelDB. Um, they're updated in real time as writes come in in a non-blocking manner, uh, which is to say that as you're writing the, K, the, the, KV, uh, the key value data, um, its write will not be blocked on this hash tree operation. Um, they're periodically exchanged. By default, we have a tick of every 60 seconds. We exchange a certain number of partitions. Um, we invoke read repair and re-index on divergence. Um, and periodically, they're rebuilt. And that gets back to the fact that you would have lots of failures. Even this could go wrong. Somehow, your tree could get um, uh, diverge from your actual data. So periodically, we just say, you know what? We don't trust the system at all. Throw away the trees. Rebuild it. Um, and by default, we do, uh, a tree gets expired every week. So some of you might be thinking, you know, I don't know if maybe any of you have ever run, like, say, a MySQL solar setup or, or solar and anything else, right? And you might be thinking, well, why don't you just write something that detects when an when a, when a index to solar fails, right? And then you write it in a log entry and you retry it or something like that. And that might work most of the time, but the problem is when that thing goes wrong, right? When your detector script, when that seg faults, or that file gets lost. Well, now you're in the same situation. So now you need a detector for your detector script. And then it's just turtles all the way down, because they could all fail. So the point is, in my opinion, 
I think there's too much of a focus on trying to code for prevention, and really it should be about detection and repair, because you're never actually going to prevent you're never actually going to prevent all these different failure scenarios. All right, so time for the demos, or foff for wrong. Oh, actually, I've got to run through a couple more slides really quick. I forgot. So in the sake of time, I'm actually just going to show you slides of creating a cluster instead of doing it in front of you. Um, it's right here. I start up five nodes on my local machine. Uh, I join those nodes together. Uh, I create a, a, what's called um, a plan, and this is uh, for the nodes to coordinate who's going to own what partitions. And this allows you to create many plans. If you didn't like one of them, you could do another. And then I commit the plan. And then I check my membership, and I have five nodes, which roughly own an even amount of the ring. Uh, right now, the ring size is 64 partitions, so it doesn't divide evenly with five. So you get a bit of an imbalance. Um, and then I store a schema. And then I create an index. And really quick, I'm actually redoing a demo I did at a, a recent conference called Recon East, uh, which was held by my company. Um, and the demo I gave was uh, indexing commit log history of various Basho repos. Um, so I just took a git commit log and turned it into XML and just fed that into React and Yokozuna. Um, and I indexed the repo name, commit author, date, subject, and body. Uh, and I use this tool called Basho Bench to load the data, a really cool uh, Erlang benchmarking tool for any of you Erlang people out there. All right, so let's do the real demos now. So the first thing I want to show is I said any node can handle anything, right? So I want to show you running a query on four different nodes. So here's a query, whoop, here's a query where I'm searching for a V node in the commit body. Um, and you can see the shards parameter that was formed. Uh, this big, bad-looking thing right here is a filter query that's required to make sure you don't get overlaps. Since there's replication, you could have overlaps. Um, I know this looks scary and nasty. Um, there's actually only um, a few different types of filter queries, so the filter query cache will only have a few entries. It's not going to constantly do cache eviction there. Um, and yeah, you can see the results. And you can see this is exactly as Solar would return it. And this is coming from Yokozuna. So Yokozuna doesn't mess with the return at all. So like I said, you could use your existing Solar cl clients to query this. So that was node one, and I just want to show you really quick. That's query against node two. Num found was 85, just like on the first one. I could do it against node three. Num found 85, same thing. And I could do it on the fourth one. Num found 85. So any node could take a request. Um, so let's see what happens if I take some nodes down. That's a little big. Um, but basically what this is showing you is that dev, uh, node 4 and node 5 are definitely down. All right, so let's run those queries again. Actually get rid of these real quick. So responded 85 again. Node 2 responded 85 again. Node 3. 85 again, and node 4, which should obviously fail because it's down. OK, so now what happens if I store data while these nodes are down, which was the hinted handoff stuff I was telling you about? So just to verify, this repo, um, the commit log for Yokozuna has not been stored yet. So I get num found equals 0. Let's go ahead and load that up real quick. Uh, and you can just ignore all that crazy stuff flying by. Uh, yeah, that should have worked. All right, so I stored it. So now if I query node 1, I get results, 396. All right, so now really quickly, I'm going to do this thing here. This is just to tell um, handoff 
not to do any work because I want to show you, I don't want to hand off to um, race against me because I want to show you uh, that the nodes are up but they don't have the data. So that's going to turn hand off, off temporarily. And then I'm going to start the nodes. And then, so now I'm going to query the Node 4 Solar instance directly. This isn't going to go through Yokozuna. And the point of that is just to show you it doesn't know about Yokozuna, right? Because it just came up, um, and I turned handoff off, so it doesn't know anything about Yokozuna yet. But now I'm going to go ahead and let handoff do its job. And I'm going to change that to something higher so it goes a little quicker. I'm going to clear this real quick. So in a moment, we should see some logs flash by. Hopefully. All right, you can do it. Did it not set? Uh-oh. Oh, come on. This is the problem with live demos. There's always a chance for failure. Oh, well, that's odd. I did this three times. Oh, there we go. Um, so as we can see here, we see log entries, uh, hinted handoff, transfer, these various partitions, various objects. And now if we go back to, uh, no, that was the wrong one. If we query the instance directly, now we'll notice it actually has data. So it handed the data off where it needed to go. All right, so this is the real fun one. So this is the act of anti-entropy. Um, so to start with, I'm just going to go uh, uh, match all query. Um, and we have, and this is directly against the node for solar instance. So we have 6,747. And I'm going to go ahead and just completely kill the solar index for, that, um, for this index. And then I'm going to go ahead and kill 9, the JVM. And one thing we'll notice, although it's hard to see here, um, so Yokozuna noticed that the JVM just crashed and it automatically restarted it. So right now, there's no data there, because it's gone. Now, AE um, typically runs a little slower. So I got to do this gobbledygook right now real quick, just to speed it up. And hopefully, this one won't have a lag like the last one. Come on. So there we go. So just repaired 153 keys um, by active entropy for a given partition. So now if we start querying node 4 again, so now it's got 340. Now 500. Now 607. Now 789. And I can keep doing this. It's going pretty fast right now, but 1358, 1476. But anyways, this will eventually go around all the partitions and repair all the data. And it'll eventually get back to 6746. I have a screenshot to prove it, um, but I don't know if I want to make you guys sit here. It might take another minute or two. All right. Um, yeah, so as already shown, you can query from any node, use solar syntax, returns the solar result, results verbatim, um, and it means you can use existing solar clients. Um, 
Index replication allows for query availability. That's why I could run the query when nodes were down. Just need one replica to survive. Um, if too many nodes go down, though, Yokozuna will refuse to query because right now it prefers 100% uh, harvest uh, over yield. Um, because I figured people would rather uh, their query results be consistent than incomplete. But that could be changed in the future to allow you to tune it like we do with normal React. I have to put all this in for the people that aren't here. And that's it. Don't get sure. <laughs>